of you here have ever written a disaster recovery plan? Okay. <laughs> disaster recovery plan required for the phones going off. Um, how many of you here know whether the company that you currently work for has a disaster recovery plan or client if you're consulting? How many of you here have worked for somewhere that you know did not have a disaster recovery plan? <laughs> Unsurprisingly, that's where most of the hands go up. Welcome to Disaster Recovery Serverless Edition. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land I'm presenting tonight. This is and always will be Aboriginal land. Their sovereignty was never ceded. It's a fair question. Who am I? I see a few unfamiliar faces here. My name is Dawn. I do cloud security and DevOps type work at Enabler. We're a consultancy in Melbourne. We don't do a whole lot of serverless. We mostly do Kubernetes, which I know is generally, um, generally, yeah, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for Ian's reaction to that. Um, but if, if you're interested in that sort of thing, we are hiring. Um, my credentials for talking about this are that I am a habitual over planner. It is not enough to have a plan A and a plan B. I must always have at least a plan C, D, E, and F before I do anything. Outside work, I am an occasional author and kitchen alchemist. Sometimes that ends really well, sometimes it doesn't. I am also a raging sports ball fan, which is why that photo of me is me at the Winter Classic at Fenway Park, which happened earlier this year. The whole thing with disaster recovery is it's not just about the idea of what do you do when everything goes wrong. There's also this concept of business continuity, which is really about how you make sure that the business that you're working for, the business that you're engaging with, is going to be able to continue functioning regardless of what happens. And disaster recovery is an important component of a business continuity plan, but it's not the only component of a business continuity plan. Why do we need this? Well, because AWS, which is the cloud provider that I work with the most, still has a very notable single point of failure in the US East One region. And for the record, most of this talk is going to focus on AWS because that's what I've played around with the most. A lot of the concepts will translate, the specific services will not. Um, those of you who work with AWS might remember that in December 2021, we had two US East One outages in one whole month, which was a very good month for everyone who worked with AWS. The business continuity aspect, though, is often required for compliance purposes. And if you are a consultant, this will be the most common reason why you do this, because someone working in a governance, risk, and compliance team somewhere says, OK, we need to check a box. And then your phone rings and you get told, right, we need you to come in and set up a business continuity plan. We need you to work out what's going to happen. The reasons why you would actually want to do this beyond a tick box exercise are because it helps you to quickly fix misconfigured systems and corrupt data. So part of the aim with a disaster recovery plan is not just that you solve for what Kerbal Space Program would call the catastrophic failure scenario. The idea is that whatever happens with your system, you can generally respond to it quicker and understand how you would solve for those sorts of things. And most critically, business continuity and disaster recovery planning can help you mitigate against the consequences of attacks by destructive malicious actors. And a hat tip to my colleague, um, Luke Carter-Key, for surfacing this fantastic example of this. There used to be a company called Codespaces. And I say used to be, because in 2014, Codespaces was hit by a distributed denial of service attack. The attackers used privilege, ex used privilege escalation to get into Codespaces cloud accounts and grant themselves privileged access. And when the Codespaces team basically declined the ransom request, went into the system and started trying to lock the attacker out, the attacker who had a second privileged access vector just went in and deleted everything, at which point, essentially, you no longer have a business. So this is the actual reason why we should do business continuity and disaster recovery planning. And way back in the dim distant past when I was extremely small and all 
IT workloads ran in data centers, this was based around physical redundancy and separation. So the way that this would generally work if we take the Melbourne example is you need to set up two data centers because everything needs to run in two different places, okay? You stick a couple of pins on a map, you set up a data center in Belgrave, you set up a data center in Werribee. And this then means that you have to handle things like networking between your two data centers. It means that you have to handle what are you going to do with the backups. It means that you have to handle all sorts of things around various redundancies. And backups in these days were all done on tapes. So it would be a case of you would go to your data center in Belgrave, you would load the tapes into the machine, the tapes would back everything up overnight, you would take the tapes out of the machine, you would stick them in a truck, and you would drive them to somewhere else. And then if there was a fire or if there was a flood, you would hope that it did not take out your data center in Belgrave and your data center in Werribee, and you would really hope that it didn't take out the backup location as well. If you took out your data centers, you would have to get the truck, load the tapes back into the truck, ship them back to the data center, hope that they still worked and weren't degraded and that they hadn't been stored near any particularly powerful magnets, and then run the data back into your system. We live in a cloud native world, so most of the time we don't really care about this anymore. Essentially, if you're running in the cloud, whilst there might be physical separation, it's not always apparent to us. We run everything from our own machines. But every cloud provider has the concept of different regions. Every cloud provider has the concept of different availability zones, where, and those essentially correlate to the, your physical data centers in Belgrave and Werribee and your backup location in goodness no, knows where. But as disaster recovery has evolved, one of the things that's become apparent is the answer to questions like, where are we hosting things and how is the data stored are completely different depending on what paradigm we're using. So the business continuity bit of this planning is really about how will the business ensure smooth and continuous operation if something goes completely wrong, if we have that fire or we have that flood, or given that we're now progressing out of 2020 round four, we have that global pandemic. And this is not just about disaster recovery. In some cases, it's about reacting before you get to the point of a disaster. There are two core concepts which tend to come, a lot, come up a lot in the discussion of business continuity planning, uh, and that is RTO and RPO. Essentially, RTO is the question of how long can we afford for this system to be down? Can we afford for it to be down for two hours, five hours, 10 hours, 15 minutes? In some cases, if you're running absolutely mission critical workloads, can we afford for it to be, can we actually afford for this to be down for 30 seconds? Sometimes the answer to that will be no. So that's the recovery time objective. The recovery point objective, or RPO, is the question of how much data can we afford to lose? So when we bring this system back up, can we afford to be missing two weeks worth of data? The answer is most likely going to be no. Can we afford to be missing a day's worth of data, half an hour's worth of data? And the third question which comes into this is basically, can we do better than we can afford to with not that much extra effort. Because if you can cut the amount of time that it takes you to get your system up in half for not a substantial extra cost, that's going to be quite sensible to do. Ideally, when you're doing business continuity plans, you iterate. So um, again, lots of people here, faces I don't recognize, who probably haven't seen me present before. So meet Product Core. And yes, it is pronounced product core because startups have to find NAF ways to differentiate themselves. This is a Sydney-based startup and they build e-commerce software. So they have a product called Byte, um, which is essentially a um, inventory management system. They have a product called Sellit, which is basically their managed, you know, managed version of Shopify, essentially. They run on AWS and for about a year and a half now, their infrastructure has been entirely serverless. So they use, that. basically the core architecture is they use Lambda for compute, they use DynamoDB for data storage, and for any long running workflows which they need to track, they use step functions. There are other services which become important here as well. We'll go through some of those in a minute, but things like EventBridge, Route 53, application load balancers, 
are all services which would be integrated into basically your whole system, but those are the core services that Product Core is using. And apologies to any Mongolians here because I'm going to absolutely butcher her name again. Um, the cloud platform lead at Product Core is Otgon Batengtia, and she originally trained as a civil engineer. One thing that you learn as a civil engineer is it's very good to have some sort of plan for what happens before your bridges fall over. Because when your bridges fall over, um, people tend to not be too happy about that. So as she's transitioned into tech, she's been working in tech for some years and has taken this job. She has basically taken responsibility for business continuity and disaster recovery planning across the business. Now, the caveat here is whilst I'm using Product Core as a um, whilst I'm using Product Core as a demonstration and I have built out this particular architecture. I don't really touch serverless. This is my first foray into serverless architecture. So I think I know what I'm talking about. But if any of you have any understanding beyond what I've got, please come and argue with me afterwards because I would love to learn more about this. So when we get into the matter of business continuity and disaster recovery planning, one thing that you're generally going to be looking at is what are your failure scenarios? And these failure scenarios are, as I said earlier, entirely specific to your company's infrastructure. If you're running in data centers, they're going to be completely different to if you're running in AWS, if you're running in Azure, if you're running in GCP, all of the cloud providers will be different. It will be different depending on whether you're running serverless architecture, partially serverless architecture, whether you're running everything still on servers. And these failure scenarios, when you consider them, should cover many, many different domains. So we're not just talking about you wake up one morning at 0300 because your pager goes off and the whole system's down. We're also talking about scenarios like what happens if someone accidentally deploys code which doesn't function properly and your data gets corrupted? Or what happens if a malicious actor comes in and manages to overwrite some of your data? What happens if you misconfigure your DNS provider and that the it's always DNS adage that takes out so many systems so frequently. It's something that you have to have a plan for. So these are the things that you would want to think about when you're talking about failure scenarios. So one of Product Core's workflows, which is the one that I want to focus on here, is a workflow for basically reordering products when your inventory runs low. Essentially, the very high level of the way that this works and I apologize, I'm not good at drawing infrastructure diagrams, so this is in text, is um, event bridge triggers a step function when the stock is low. Step function then basically kicks off a workflow, sends that information to Lambda, Lambda goes away, orders the product on an external vendor's website. There's a step functions can then track how that's going. Once the package is delivered and Step Functions is able to recognize that, there's a manual approval step to ensure that the stock has actually arrived in the warehouse. So one of the things with Step Functions is you, base, you can basically tie together multiple different serverless workflows, but it is possible to have manual approval steps in there. Then once it's been manually approved, you've verified that the amount of stock that you've got is the amount that you ordered. It's arrived in the warehouse. There's triggers off another Lambda function, which goes and updates the stock level in DynamoDB. All of that data is then served to the client via your standard web workflow CloudFront Route 53. And events kind of overcame me here because I had started to write this talk and then the Melbourne region got released. So Product Core, as they've been going through this, They've started, um, basically they started with all of their data being mirrored to Singapore. So they were running just the core workloads in Sydney, in AP Southeast 2. And um, the aim was when the Melbourne region was released that they were going to be able to then roll out a multi-region active, active architecture. One of the key points here that's worth considering with serverless is theoretically, if you're dealing with properly serverless, serverless architecture, deploying it in multiple places at once doesn't cost you anything or shouldn't cost you anything. Now that AWS is releasing services like 
redshift serverless, this is no longer true. We'll get back to that later. But the core concepts here translate no matter what sort of cloud provider or what sort of service offering you're using. You want to have a database. In this case, it's DynamoDB. You want to configure that to replicate across different regions. In this case, it's replicating across Sydney and Singapore. Um, a couple of AWS specific things, again, may or may not be equivalents in another cloud provider. Uh, making sure that deleting data requires multi-factor authentication if you can. And you want to make sure that you've got support for some sort of point in time restore. DynamoDB does that. You can roll back to, I believe it's 35 days from the point at which, basically the current point. The advantage of being able to roll back over a longer period is if something goes wrong and you don't notice it for a couple of weeks, you still have the ability to roll back to before the problem happened. And then you can essentially run your Lambda and step function type workflows either on hot standby in a second region or as Product Core is currently doing, you can run two versions of them in different places. This is the equivalent of your data centers on either side of Melbourne, basically. It's just the serverless version. So for specific products as regards AWS, Lambda is a truly serverless service. You are only charged for what you use, which means that you can take the same, the same Lambda code if you want, and you can deploy it in every single AWS region that runs. As your functions and whatever the GCP equivalent of this is, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, I'm fairly sure both work the same way. So provided that you're dealing with sort of that basic serverless code, serverless code runner, pretty much everywhere you go as a general concept, you will be able to deploy this any way you want for free. You only get charged per execution. The other thing with Lambda specifically, because AWS has Route 53, which manages DNS, you can actually configure Lambda if you want to through Route 53 with a couple of proxy services in between to send requests to the closest region. So you configure Route 53 via whatever other services you're dealing with to send requests to the closest region. There are two ways in AWS of doing that. Geolocation routing, which is fairly naive, and geoproximity routing, which is slightly more sophisticated and also allows you to add bias to reduce latency. But broadly, Provided that your setup is running on some sort of code runner, you're, not, you're generally not going to be charged for deploying that wherever you want. So if you want to run it in every single region that your cloud provider supports, go for it. In the case of DynamoDB specifically, uh, AWS has a feature called Global Tables, which replicates data across multiple regions. Again, I'm fairly sure that the Azure version's got this. I'm not sure about the GCP version. Um, I would imagine so. The thing though with replicating data from any two, basically across any two points, is there will be some latency involved with that. That depends on how close the two points are. And in AWS, at least, you can check that. So the core question here basically becomes, how many regions do you need to replicate to at once? Because whilst you might want to go and deploy that serverless code runner in, every single region that your cloud provider supports, there is going to be a significant cost attached to replicating data across different cloud regions in a serverless database. So it might be that you want to set up multiple different databases and have them only replicate across two regions. It might be that you really do want to replicate everything everywhere, but I dread to think what the bill for that is going to look like. Then you've got um, step functions. Very nice um, AWS specific service. I don't know whether Azure and GCP have equivalents of that. Again, this isn't only pay for what you use service, so you can deploy that step function any way you want. The thing though with step functions is it gets a bit hairy when you try to send data across multiple regions. It's actually very, very hard to do this. I tried, I tried to make this fail with my relatively decent Terraform code, and I couldn't. So basically, the, the caveat with this is, as long as you're not trying to do anything silly to get it to send data across multiple regions in the process of running the step function, you're probably going to be fine. I've heard reports that if you are going to try and do that, you're going to run into a world of pain very, very quickly. 
One of the reasons, though, why I wanted to discuss this in AWS specifically, quite apart from the fact that I generally use AWS for most things day to day, is that AWS has a much larger serverless feature set than a lot of the other cloud providers. It also has Route 53. So if you want, you can run DNS built in the whole thing, domain registration, DNS, the whole lot through AWS. AWS has also been pushing, in terms of serverless disaster recovery, a neat little service called the Route 53 Application Recovery Controller, or ARC. Apologies that this is very text dense. We'll get to the reason for that in a minute. So Route 53 ARC works for whatever you can put essentially behind a load balancer. Or whatever you can, not, not sure that it's quite whatever you can put behind a load balancer, but the most common scenario is Route 53 ARC works for anything you can put behind a load balancer. So this means that it works for Lambda, it works for ECS Fargate, it works for traditional servers. It can be used to manage both availability zone failovers and region failovers if you really need it to. If you want to run that multi-region active active configuration, you can do that within the Route 53 application recovery controller and then set up a region-based, essentially a region-based failover, which you can manually toggle if you start to have problems with your system. But then we run into that single point of failure problem again because Route 53 ARC only has partial high availability. If you want to use it to set up routing controls, that's replicated across five regions which AWS themselves have chosen. So one thing to note here is if you're dealing, if you're working for a big bank or you're working for any, in any very heavily regulated industry, check your data sovereignty requirements because you might actually run into issues just from using the routing controls if, because they're essentially offshore. The other single point of failure is that the readiness checks, which are the thing that you really want to be running to make sure that your system is actually working correctly, only run in US West 2. This is admittedly better in that it's not the AWS classic single point of failure of US East 1, but the, the core concept there to understand is you do actually want to make sure that in a lot of these services that cloud providers build, you understand where the hidden single points of failure are. That's really important for business continuity and disaster recovery. Back to more general concepts, because the failover process as it happens generally translates fairly well across all of the different serverless architectures that you can set up, all of the different serverless providers. In general, your serverless system is going to have fewer potential failure points. It follows from the fact that we do not need to manage servers. Someone else is managing the underlying infrastructure for us. We don't need to worry about those servers or virtual machines or instances failing. The other thing is that if we don't have to configure those servers or virtual machines or instances, systems are going to come up a hell of a lot faster because there is no overhead. The common failure scenario that I ran into when I was testing this is the scenario where you basically push out misconfigured code across your systems. There are a couple of ways that you can mitigate against that, but essentially, it does not matter how good your serverless disaster recovery is. It doesn't matter how many regions you're deploying to. If you deploy the same thing to them all at once and that same thing is misconfigured somehow, you are back to square one, or again, to borrow the Kerbal Space Program term, catastrophic failure. A Couple of ways that you can mitigate against that. Don't deploy to all of your different cloud provider regions at once. Pick one, deploy there first, check to make sure that everything is working, pick a few more, deploy to them first, eventually slowly roll it out everywhere. If you only have two, deploy to one first, verify that the new version is working, deploy to the second one. The other way to do it is with a more traditional canary deployment setup. So basically, you roll the code out everywhere, but you start by only sending five or ten percent to the new, five or ten percent of your traffic to the newer version. Then you slowly build that up over time until one hundred percent of your traffic is going to the newer version, and the old version can be completely spun down. As I was building this out. I ran into quite a lot of dragons around serverless disaster recovery. 
The first one that I ran into was I built out a very, very small proof of concept in Terraform. And the Melbourne region came out and I went, okay, this is, this is great. I was talking about planned multi-region active active. I can go and test this. And I pushed the button and everything promptly failed on me. Cloud providers may not always deploy the same things to different regions. When a cloud provider releases a new region, there is a good chance that it is not going to have all of the functionality that you would generally expect from older, more established regions. Setting up data centers takes time, it costs money. The hardware can be really difficult to provision. We've seen over the past few years, there have been a bunch of bottlenecks in getting parts. When a cloud provider rolls out a new region, if you're using third party services like in this instance, Terraform, they might not know what to do with it. If you're, if you're using third party services, like say you're using a third party for your DNS, and you suddenly decide that you want to roll everything out to multiple regions, well then that's more overhead that's got to be built into more places in the system. Are you sure that your DNS provider supports all of this? The other thing which is um, a massive problem in the AWS ecosystem, and it, AWS now has a proliferation of services like this, is services which claim to be serverless but aren't actually serverless, where there is an underlying charge for whatever time period that you run the service in. That's, if you understand the definition of serverless for the purposes of serverless disaster recovery as we can roll this out wherever we want and not get charged, and then you run into these serverless but not server-free serverless solutions, you might end up with some quite nasty bill shock as a result of that. My advice if you're trying to set up a serverless disaster recovery solution like this is stick to the simple services, stick to whatever you can find that's truly serverless. Once you get into the world of trying to run, you know, trying to do disaster recovery for serverless solutions which aren't truly serverless, or once you're trying to do disaster recovery dealing with multiple third-party vendors, it becomes significantly more complicated. When you're dealing with your traditional data center setup or even a server-based setup in the cloud, that doesn't matter as much because there's still a significant amount of complexity involved in disaster recovery. But the real trick with serverless disaster recovery is if you do it correctly, it actually makes everything substantially more simple because you can just run it everywhere. And provided that you have the proper control set up, you can then do whatever you want with it. That's not the case when you're dealing with these non-server-free serverless solutions. As per the warning, here be dragons. A couple more things that are important to understand about disaster recovery in general. If you haven't tested your disaster recovery plan, you can't be sure that it works. If you are running a serverless disaster recovery setup that relies on having things always run in multiple regions, that's not a problem. If you're not, please do make sure that you actually test it. A part of that question of integrating testing into your day-to-day -day workflow is that serverless actually makes this much easier to do and much cheaper to do because there's no overhead cost to having something always deployed in multiple places at once but there are always going to be holes, so make sure that you understand what they are. In some cases, that's going to be a cloud provider single point of failure. In some cases, that's going to be a third party vendor, which doesn't do something the way that you think it should, or you discover if you haven't tested the plan that they don't actually support failing things over in a particular way, or it's a third party vendor which itself has single points of failure involved in it. And because there will always be scenarios where the system goes down, your alerting is part of the plan. So think about when you want to wake people up, think about why you want to wake people up, think about what information you want to give people when you wake them up. The easier that you can make it for people to respond to a failure, the better off you're going to be, the easier it's going to be for you to meet the recovery time and recovery point objectives. That brings me to the end of my first foray into serverless architecture. I'm happy to take questions. Otherwise, contacts are up there. There's also a link to the GitHub repository, which has all of the talks that I've done previously. It was lovely to speak to you all today. I hope to come back again sometime.
So the question was about, um, I talked a lot about active, active, but what about active, active, passive, where you're running something in a cloud provider, you're running something in basically a second cloud provider. The, the question of multi-cloud provider is always a fun one. Multi-cloud and hybrid cloud and all of these solutions, there are scenarios where you're going to need to do it, but there's a significant time investment involved in that. I couldn't take the proof of concept that I built for AWS and plug that straight into Azure Functions. It just wouldn't work. The thing with running any, because I guess there's two questions there. If you're running, if you're running your serverless solution in multiple cloud providers, you're adding back a decent chunk of the complexity that you remove by running a serverless solution to begin with. So think about why you would want to do that. Think about how you're going to do that. And really, really think about that whether, really, really think about whether that is what you want to do. I would venture to say that in most cases, if you're running a serverless solution for the simplicity of it, the answer to that is going to be no. The active, active, passive question though, within one serverless ecosystem, it's actually not that hard to run. If you want an added level of redundancy, it's often not that hard to run an active, active configuration and then basically have a third, a third region passively set up or have a third region to which your data is being replicated. And in some cases that might, if you don't have to deal with data sovereignty requirements, that might provide you with the same, or not quite as good, but it might provide you with the same sort of general benefit that you would get in that you're going from two locations where that data is stored or two locations where your application could run to three. Just make sure that you've actually got all of the routing and things set up to handle passive failover to the third location if your two active locations both go down at once. Has there been a scenario where a cloud provider's had two regions go down at once? I can't think of one. I, that's true, but US East 1 is a single point of failure. Yeah. When S3 goes down, S3 goes down, it can have a flow effect on other regions as well. That's just because of the way it's built. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's more that the, co the most common scenarios with cloud providers are you lose one region or you lose everything. Um, but again, if you really want to do, if you really want to go that route of having it on multi multiple cloud providers, one other thing, like there's a significant complexity in maintaining that. Another point where you're going to get hit is if you're storing any significant amount of data, you then have to deal with data ingress and egress charges across the clouds. And that's, that's not cheap. That is such a diplomatic way of saying, don't do multi-cloud. Dawn is just way more diplomatic than I am. <laughs> yeah, very good. Dawn, Dawn has had many years to develop diplomacy skills. Very good, very diplomatic. Um, <laughs> Any more questions? So you, you say active, active config, I mean, active, active uh, uh, setup of the disaster recovery. Is there a chance of uh, misconfiguration? Oh yeah. Um, the question was if you have an active, active setup, um, basically running things in two places at once, is there a chance of misconfiguration? Yes, there is. And generally the most common single points of failure there are going to be to do with DNS. If you, because right, Route 53 is a global service. Generally DNS, whatever DNS provider you use is going to have some level of redundancy built in. But if you stuff up the DNS, then that's basically the point at which everything just goes completely, generally goes completely sideways. And, and you see that from the fact that a lot of outages that big businesses have had. AWS has had a few, Facebook has had a few, I think Cloudflare's had at least one, where the whole system has gone down. It's because of DNS misconfigurations, which then have to be rolled back. So you can run something in an active, active configuration all you want. The 
misconfiguration which is most likely to trip you up if you do it properly is the DNS. The other scenario where you can have everything taken down by a misconfiguration when you're running an active active setup is that scenario of you misconfigure something further down and you deploy it to everywhere at once. Hey, so to my understanding, active active means it shares load equally, isn't it? Um, generally, yes. It might be that it shares load. It, it, it means that both both or every component of the system takes load at the same time, and they can theoretically take the same load. I say that because if you wanted to configure, you know, if you wanted to configure your setup in every single AWS region at once, and you wanted to do some sort of locational proximity-based routing, you might find that even in a configuration which is active in every AWS region, you're going to end up with different amounts of traffic going to different places just depending on where your user base is. Or even if we were talking about the, the scenario of you're running it in Sydney, you're running it in Melbourne, if 90% of your user base is in Melbourne and 10% is in Sydney, in the serverless, basically in the serverless world, you might still have an active, active configuration in that both are running at once, but 90% of the traffic is going to be routed to Melbourne generally because that's where the people are closest to. That's where you're going to have the lowest latency. Yeah, that's where my question comes from. So when it shares loads, maybe 90% or 50%, right? So there will be no chance of misconfiguration, right? Both are working already. Like I said, as regards, the mis as regards misconfiguration, if you're talking about human error, it can still happen, and the places where it will generally happen are DNS or if you push out changes to everywhere at once. Tom, I think we need to recreate that meme where you say it's always DNS. <laughs> <laughs> it's always DNS. And in your example, you said you will be presenting the data via CloudFront, right, in the last line of your example. Yeah, pr and essentially, if you're presenting um, the website which is presented to clients, yes. it runs through CloudFront and is served through Route 53. And Yeah, um, the Route 53 geolocation and geoproximity is for um, is for inbound data. So I, it's not. I probably need to go back and revise the slides before I do the talk again. Essentially, it's two different workflows. So outbound data go outbound data via a website, CloudFront, Route 53. Inbound requests are inbound requests would be coming through Route 53 would be coming through Route 53, not attached to CloudFront. That's where the geolocation and geoproximity routing would come in. Thank you. Yeah, one last question. So yeah. when you define an RTO and RPO um, yep. for disaster recovery plan, so for example, not all the businesses will use Route 53. They use Cloudflare and Fastly yep. and DNS servers, as you're talking about. So, um, so they itself, the internet, they have their own RTO and RPO. So when you discuss yep. your disaster recovery plan, you need to consider those RTO as well, right? So how yes. do you because there is an internal dependency on your vendors. So how you do the disaster recovery test, how frequently is, you know, people are doing it in, in the real world? So there are a couple of things that talk about um, vendors having RTOs and RPOs of their own, and also about disaster recovery testing. One of my favorite scenarios, which I have encountered in the wild and I'm not going to say where, is a scenario where a company goes, well, we can set a more ambitious RTO and RPO than our vendors and lie to all of our clients about it. Don't do this. It is a fair point when you, when you, one of the reasons why I sort of phrase that bit about RTO and RPO the way that I do, basically, how long can we afford for these systems to be down is because if you're dealing with external, you know, how long can we afford for these systems to be down? How much data can we afford to lose? Is because if you're dealing with an external vendor whose RTO and RPO means that, basically, if you're dealing with an external vendor that's going to lose a bunch of your data, and by the time they lose a bunch of your data, you would have gone out of business, you need to rethink the way that you're doing DR. And that probably means you need to use a different vendor for that. So understanding what your external vendors provide is really important for RTO and RPO. And 
please, please, please don't say that you have a better RTO and RPF than your vendors do and then lie about it to your clients. Um, as regards the testing question, as often as you can. One of the reasons why, as I did my deep dive into this, I'm starting to really like the idea of serverless, even though I don't get to play with it all that much, is because a serverless arch architecture allows you to test more components of your disaster recovery in the day-to-day -day running of your system. So test the whole disaster recovery plan as often as you can. But the other critical point, which I think a lot of people often miss is any disaster recovery tests or disaster recovery checks, which you can integrate into your day-to-day -day workflow, that's really good. So deploy as much of your system as you can using CI, CD. Set up your system to be self-healing as much as you can. Sometimes go in and shut things down and see what happens. Set it up so that if you're using, not so much in the solids, but if you're using things like spot instances, that's also going to be a test of your disaster recovery and that you're then testing basically how quickly can you bring new systems up. And if you're using serverless altogether, often it's really, really easy to integrate the testing into your day-to-day -day workflow because you just go, okay, send some amount of data over here. You know, in the worst case scenario, send our test data to some completely different region, make sure that the Lambda function still spins up and responds in a reasonable amount of time, or your Azure function or whatever the GCP equivalent is. So that, that's my take on that. There you go. Why wouldn't you be serverless, right? Case closed. Sorry, Kubernetes. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? I think the last one. Oh, um, sorry, a friend of mine told me Banks use two cloud providers. Yep, they do. Yeah, it sounds like a mistake. <laughs> yeah, it does. I didn't. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Some banks using. The question was about basically some banks using multiple cloud providers. Yeah, AWS, Azure, GCP, pick two or all three of the three, depending on how ambitious you want to be. This is something that a lot of companies do because they run in highly regulated industries where there is some requirement for them to be able to retain customer data in a, you know, at a certain percentage of time to a certain level of accuracy. And like if you're dealing with people's money, you're generally going to want to be very careful about that. That probably means that you don't want all of your data in the one place. You definitely don't want to run it all in one availability zone in one region of one cloud provider. The more locations you can store that data, the better off you'll be. The second question there, which comes into play, particularly again, when you're dealing with money is, if your system goes down, how long is it going to take for people to be able to access their money? And I know of some banks which run multi-cloud architectures or hybrid cloud architectures. I know of some banks which still run some of their data in data centers. I know of some banks which have just said, we're all doing it in one place and we're going to find, you know, we're, we're doing it in one place and our reasoning to the regulators is, when have these cloud providers gone completely down up to this point? So my standard recommendation for multi-cloud is if you can avoid doing it, don't do it. If you think you have a reason, there you go, being slightly less diplomatic this time. If you think you have a reason to do it, think very carefully about what that reason is. And generally, if you are thinking about doing multi-cloud, but you're worried about the amount of money that you would need to spend to have engineers maintain your solution on multiple cloud providers at once, you probably don't need to do multi-cloud because you're probably not in one of those heavily regulated industries where you're making money hand over fist and can afford to do it. There you go. Thank you, Dom. Let's thank you again.